We are very grateful that you are here to worship with us today. My name is Pastor Randy Schrader from Our Savior Lutheran Church in beautiful West Lafayette, Indiana. We are located right next to the Purdue University campus on the corner of West Fowler Avenue and Vine Street. Now, there are many ways of connecting with Our Savior Lutheran Church, a few of which you can see on your screen. But the best way, if you have a specific question, is to send us an email to info at osluth.org. If you are watching this via Facebook, we want you to know that we appreciate that you are here. Would you please give us a like or write something in the comments? It's a great way of sharing any prayer concerns that you might have. And of course, you can always join us live every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. and 11.30 a.m. We ask that you wear a mask. That way we keep everyone just a little bit more safe. Please prepare your hearts, minds, and souls for worship. Welcome to our second Sunday in Lent. A quick note, the council has made the decision and uh, agreeing with the CDC to make wearing masks optional when worshiping. So moving forward until further notice, beginning March 20th, next Sunday, masks will be optional in the sanctuary during worship. Now today, in Psalm 27, we hear the Lord is my stronghold in my life. Of whom shall I fear? Our invitation in today's word is to notice God, the stronghold, a sheltering place in all of our readings. Let us begin our service today with a call to worship. Siblings in Christ, long ago God laid the foundation of this place. Geology shaped by glaciers, the formation of this land would later attract its people and its fixed richness in the soil and water in the Wabash River. God gathers us in a place shaped by nature. We are here in this place. The Potawatomi, Delaware, Miami, and Shawnee people found plenty planting corn and hunting white-tailed deer until white settlers forced them to leave or disappear. The Native Americans shaped this place. Broken treaties and erasure have too. God gathers us in a place shaped by history. We, we are, are here. here. In 1955, in this place, 15 people in West Lafayette petitioned the Indiana Synod of the ULC to establish a mission congregation. Old schools were converted into our meeting places until we built a home on the edge of Purdue's campus. Tied together by hope, by the university, and by one baptism in Jesus Christ, OSLC and PLM have worked together since the 1960s. God gathers us in a place shaped by God's desire. We are here. In this place, God has gathered us to marvel at God's power over creation, to lament humanity's abuse of the earth and one another, to remember our past, to hope for our future. This hope will not disappoint us because God is here. God, God is, is here. here. Beloved, as we gather in this place to worship, we acknowledge that we are part of a complicated history. How, How can, can we, we bear, bear the paradox, paradox of this place as both a source of pride and a record of mistakes. Friends, here is the font. In the waters of baptism, God cleanses us and claims us. God binds us. God binds God's word to this abundant element, precisely to tell us that there is no place where we are apart from God's grace. This reminder is everywhere. It is in the waters of the Wabash, it sprays from our showers. It makes tea kettles whistle. It is in our very cells. So I invite you to make the sign of the cross on your brow or your body or on that of your neighbor. As you do, we proclaim what is true everywhere and always. God is, is here. here. 
God, God is, is here. here. Amen. Amen. Will you please join us in singing our first song, The God of Abraham Praise, verses 1 and 4. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Oh God, you are the protector. Of whom should we be afraid? In the shadow of the cross, you have built a refuge for all from the siblings of sin, from the slings of sin and death. You are the shelter that truly shields us. Yours is the embrace that fully claims us. You and nothing else are the stronghold of our life. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. A reading from the book of Genesis. God promises a childless and doubting Abram that he will have a child, that his descendants will be as numerous as the stars, and that the land of Canaan will be their inheritance. Abram's trust in God is sealed with a covenant-making ceremony, a sign of God's promise. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. 
But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring, and so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. No one but your very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven, count the stars. If you are able to count them, then he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought him all these and cut them in two, laying each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a deep and terrifying darkness descended upon him. When the sun had gone down, and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. The word of the Lord. Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Evildoers assail me to devour my flesh. My adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, that will I seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter. In the day of trouble, he will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. Now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent the sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart says, seek his face. Do not, do not turn your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You who have been my help, do not cast me off. Do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. The Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Do not give me up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me. They are breathing out violence. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. A reading from the book of Philippians. Although Paul's devotion to Christ has caused him to be persecuted, he does not regret the course he has taken. Writing from prison, he expresses confidence in a glorious future 
and encourages other Christians to follow in his footsteps. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears. Their end is destruction. Their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to the body of his glory, by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. The word of the Lord. Gospel according to St. Luke, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to Jesus, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finished my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way, because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you we're not willing. See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The gospel of our Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. And I'll invite any of the children like to come up for a children's message to meet me up front. Anybody want to come up this morning? Checking the see if there's... Yeah, we do have some people. Hey, good morning, good morning. I got something in here to show you. I'm excited. How excited are you? No, yeah? I see somebody that's excited. They got a smile on their face at least. It's kind of early, isn't it? It's a little bit earlier than normal. Right? We had to set our clocks early. It's a, what is that? A chicken? Oh, maybe it's a rooster. We're going to pretend it's a hen. And actually, I'm going to try to get these batteries disconnected because it'll keep going and going and going. Okay. I didn't hurt. The chicken, the chicken is just fine. But did you hear today that Jesus says he wanted to gather people up like a hen gathers her chickens, her little chicks. So when you're thinking about God and you picture God, yeah, what do you picture? 
Well, you know, that has to happen every once in a while, right? But sometimes they just do that out in the wild, right? It just happens naturally. So, yeah, so what if all well, you know, that sometimes will happen too. But the thing is, the important thing is that they're all together, right? That they're all together. And as Jesus said, or when we actually start thinking about and picturing God, there's a lot of language in our Bible that calls God um, Father, right? But there's also other images of God, like we hear today about Jesus wanting to gather his children like a hen gathers her brood of chicks. And there's even other language in our um, Bible that refers God to a mother taking care of babies. Yes. There's, well, that's a great question. Is God a girl? Well, we are all made in God's image, right? And there's all kinds of genders out there, right? Male and female. There's all different types of people. And if we are all created in God's image, hmm, maybe, just maybe, God is all of it, right? Because we are all made in the image of God. No specific color, no specific gender. It is all the way that we are made and how we think about God's image in our minds. So let us pray. Good and gracious God, we thank you for all the creative ways you let us know who you are and how you love us. We thank you for this. We ask you to help us to show others that same love and respect. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you so very much for coming up. We'll put Henrietta back in there. Grace, mercy, and peace from our Creator and our Lord Jesus Christ to you this morning. Amen. Thank you so very much for setting your clocks ahead. Thank you all for joining us from home. It's great to see you. Um, can't lie, I was getting a little bit worried when uh, the, the prelude music was playing and, and we had less people in, the, in here. I'm like, oh, it's going to be one of those Sundays. Um, time change and, and, and that sometimes just happens. But thank you for your attention. I, for the last 18 days, our attention, our hearts have been pulled east. For 18 days, Ukraine has been under siege by the Russian army led by their heartless leader, one of my colleagues, whom most of you are familiar with, said during our pericope study on Tuesday, Psalm 27 is a psalm of President Zelensky. And I heard this psalm in a new way, in a way I hadn't heard it before. Listen to these words again, and keep in mind it was written 3,000 years ago, yet fits our context today. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me. My heart shall not fear. The war rises up against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord that will I, that I, that will I seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in God's temple. For God will hide me in God's shelter in the day of trouble. God will conceal me under the cover of God's tent. God will set me high on a rock. President Zelensky is in the middle of total chaos. Threats from the Russian army on every side. And he stays right where he is. He unites his fellow Ukrainians and leads them with bravery and determination. 
He has created a stronghold in Kiev and continues to stay in its borders. Yet I wonder if the stronghold in which he remains is one created or if it comes from his Jewish faith and his interpretation of this psalm in the Jewish Bible. The Lord, Adonai in Hebrew, is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I fear? The Reverend Victoria Larson writes, what a gorgeous name for God, stronghold, the place where we are safe. This is a compelling declaration of faith out of which flows a courageous roar of challenge. She continues, but the fact that this challenge arrives in the form of a question is telling. It introduces the possibility of an uncertainty. Indeed, of what shall we be afraid? If we don't take that question seriously, if we ignore the fact that we mere mortals do have fears, then we ignore the greatest threat to God's role as our stronghold. It's precisely the things that we fear to which we ascribe power. And it is precisely the things that hold power over us that can replace God as our stronghold. Again, giving credit to where credit is due, the sermon is influenced by Reverend Larson's sermon notes found in our Lenten resource from Barn Geese Worship. How often do we focus on the stronghold that God is in our lives? At times, we tend to focus on the darkness when something frightens us. And then we break down in the midst of of that terror. It's imperative that we acknowledge the fear in our lives. These fears show us that God is our stronghold and that we rely on God for life-giving grace. Martin Luther wrote in his paper, The Darkness of Faith, when your conscience is terrified by the law and is wrestling with the judgment of God, do not consult either reason or the law but rely on grace and the word of comfort. Here, take your stand as though you have, had never heard the law. Ascend into the darkness where neither the law nor reason shines, but on only the dimness of faith, which assures us that we are saved by Christ alone without any law. Thus the gospel leads us above and beyond the light of the law and reason into the darkness of faith where the law and reason have no business. In the darkness, in facing our challenges and our fears, we are supported by the stronghold of God through love and grace. In our scripture today, we are given two examples facing fear and and we hear God pulling those into God's shelter and stronghold. First, we heard of Abram and Sarai. Abram is told by God, do not be afraid, I am your shield. But Abram is fearful. For everything to work out, Abram knows. For him to become a great nation, he must have an heir. Well, you know the story. Abram and Sarah are mature in years, and the only heir he has is fathered with another woman. But God tells him to look up to the dark night sky, illuminated only by the millions of stars, and says, count the stars if you are able to count them. So shall your descendants be, says the Creator. And Abram believes God tells Abram, God will give him this land to possess. Abram is fearful because he doesn't see what God sees. Therefore, he asks, how will I know this will happen? 
God tells him to make a specific covenantal sacrifice. Cutting the sacrifices in two and laying the halves against each other. Then as the sun goes down, and this is important, a deep sleep falls upon Abram. And a deep, terrifying darkness descends upon him. In the darkness, a smoking pot and a flaming torch pass between these pieces. God makes a covenant with Abram in this way, showing up in the darkness and promises that the descendants of Abraham and Sarai will receive the land. They are, they are then pulled back into the stronghold of God. Abram reclaims God as his stronghold. Abram trusts in God, that God will be true to God's promise and righteousness. God will protect him. The Lord is the stronghold of his life. In the gospel today, we hear Jesus address the city, the people of Jerusalem. He addresses their fear, for the people of Jerusalem are not trusting in divine guidance, as Reverend Larson states. But first, Jesus addresses the Pharisees as they come to him. He is in danger from Herod. Jesus stands up to Herod through the Pharisees by saying to them, tell that fox. Couldn't find a stuffed fox. He will not intimidate me. I have work to do. I must complete the work God has given me. I will cast out demons and heal the sick for the next three days. On the third day, when Jesus finishes his work, he will then head to Jerusalem. We hear these somewhat confusing words finally come from Jesus. Today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. Jesus is referring to the fear people felt by referring to the fear that people felt of Jerusalem. When God sent prophets to lead them, the Israelites feared the prophets because the prophets proclaimed God's way of thinking. They didn't understand. They thought those in power, those in power actually thought that they would lose their power. And those without power feared that a worse tyrant would then gain it. This change of power and, and division changed the forces of Jerusalem. It forced Jerusalem to dispose of those prophets. And the darkness would eventually force Jerusalem to kill the Son of God as well. You hear the lament in Jesus' voice as he calls out to them. He cares for them, but they will not listen. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing? God calls to us. God gathers us in order to protect us. As a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but sometimes our fear becomes the place we dwell instead. It's difficult to see God's stronghold in the time of trial. It's difficult to see God's warm embrace when the shadow of darkness engulfs us. Jerusalem experienced this in the way Herod ruled his kingdom. Herod's father, Herod the Great, he loved to build these monumental kingdoms. He's the one that renovated the temple and 20 BCE, which was still happening at Jesus' time. Herod built his palace on the northwest corner of Jerusalem, high on the upper portion of the city. And to protect it, he built the citadel, a huge defense system. He also placed next to the temple mound a four-tower fortress called Antonia Fortress, overlooking the temple mound. From here, Herod could see anything that might resemble an uprising. Think about how that must have felt. As people of Jerusalem went to their temple to pray, they found themselves in the looming shadow of the monarchy, consuming them. 
Reverend Larson writes, Jesus evokes the qualities of these two very different sorts of strongholds in this passage from Luke. One kind is built in response to fear and the interest of control, like Herod's palace. And it feels like the mouth of a fox. And then there is another, like the temple, or like the arms of Jesus that extend over all the world, that feels like the wings of a sheltering hen. The first kind of stronghold will always lead us deeper into fear. The second might just lead us into world-altering courage. President Zelensky is showing world-altering courage. The whole world is pulling together around the Ukrainians. The United States and NATO is also showing world-altering courage by standing with Ukraine. Let's make one thing absolutely clear. If we and or any other nation attack Russia, even if we declare a no-fly zone over Ukraine, we are then being led deeper into that fear. Jesus knew the threat he was facing as the Pharisees warned him about the plot to kill him from Herod. He could have at that time protected himself, called others, if not millions of angels, to come down and attack Herod and all other threats. But Jesus stayed in the stronghold of God's love and grace. Jesus reveals that the way through fear is compassionate justice. When we, when he was threatened, he continues to cast out demons and cure the sick. In God's stronghold, one must persist in grace and love to make it through the darkness of fear. What is causing darkness and fear for the church today? Fear of decline or change or loss? God is with us. And God calls us to battle that fear in ways of gathering and being the body of Christ for a hurting world. To conquer fear is to to proclaim God's love in every way with every opportunity. We cannot ignore the fearful pain and sorrow in the world or in ourselves. But we are called to recognize that God is our stronghold. We are here. And in the darkness, we are called to be the city on the hill that shines the light for all to see. Amen. Will you please join us in song and singing, O God, you search me.
you please join me as we profess our faith using the ancient words of the Nicene Creed? We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Drawn close to the heart of God, we offer these prayers for the church, the world, and all who are in need. You gather your, the church into a community of mercy and grace. Unify Christians around the globe in efforts to proclaim good news, even in the face of opposition, and to protect those whose lives are imperiled by the gospel. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You create the entire universe and call it good. Hinder those who would cause further destruction of our planet's fragile ecosystems and augment the cause of those who advocate for thoughtful stewardship of the Earth's resources. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You raise up leaders committed to love and justice. Nurture in those who govern patience to receive criticism, openness to new ideas, and courage to change course when needed for the sake of the common good. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You hear us when we cry to you. Attend to those expecting a child and console those who have experienced miscarriage. Comfort veterans enduring post-traumatic stress. Shield those in endangered by domestic violence. Uphold those who are ill or grieving, especially Candy, Jason, Phil, Shirley and Eric, Rosalie, Jeff, Denise, Janet, Helmut and Carol, Kim, Victoria, Jennifer, Jeanette, Suzanne, Mike, Shelby, Eric, Joanne, Jill, Mike, David, Gary, Kevin, Randy, Jody, Dean, Vera's family, Olga, Nikolai, Artyom, Tanya, Timur, Milana, Yelena, Yuri, Nancy, Robert. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You kindle faith that moves us into action. Guide children and adults preparing for baptism or confirmation. Empower Sunday school teachers, confirmation leaders, and parents who share their faith with younger generations. Give us all a renewed sense of vocation. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You welcome us into your heavenly realm. We give thanks for those whose labors on earth are ended and who now rest with you. On the final day, gather us all with them in your loving arms. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Lord, we lift up to you those countries 
that are being oppressed, those people who find themselves cowering in fear. Help us be the church, help us to be the body of Christ, to continually search out the oppressed and bring light through your justice. Merciful God, receive, receive our, our prayer. prayer. Accept the, these prayers that we bring, O God, on behalf of a world in need, for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Please take a moment or be seated. And share that peace with others. <laughs> it's an hour earlier. I'm going to blame that on everything this morning. <laughs> Good morning, and share that peace among yourselves. You may be seated as you finish up. Um, a quick note before we continue into our offering. Thank you so very much for all that you do and continue to do. We appreciate your gifts of time, talents, and treasures. We encourage you to keep mailing those in or stop by the office, drop them off to Sandra, or use the QR code on your screen. It's because of your um, graciousness because of your generosity, we are able to continue to be the body of Christ in the greater Lafayette area. We will continue with our offering prayer. Let us pray. God, there's nowhere we can go where you aren't already waiting, in the vineyard, in the grain field, in the places where we live and work, and most especially at this table where your son has promised to meet us, where he is both host and meal. Reveal yourself to us now. Amen. Amen. Will you please stand as you are able? The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right to thank you and praise you everywhere and always, Almighty God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, through whom and with whom you have entered every place, even into human flesh. And so with every place that has known your presence, with earth and sea and sky, with unseen lands and familiar homes, with cosmic expanse and creaturely bodies, we praise your name and join the unending hymn. Mighty fortress, you are here. The stronghold of your love pervades our sacred stories. You sheltered prophets and psalmists and protected Abram and Sarai, bringing them over many miles and many doubts to rest their faith in you. But most of all, you sent Jesus, a mothering hen, whose arms outspread on the cross became sheltering wings for your beloved people. In the night when she was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering this table, the cross, the empty grave, we await his coming in glory and proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Send your spirit upon these gifts. Holy wisdom pervade every corner of this place and every crevice of our hearts. Come, come, Holy Spirit. Bring us at last with all the saints, with the stronghold of your new creation, where we may meet your glory face to face. To you, O God, mighty fortress, mothering hen, sheltering spirit, be all worship and praise, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. You may be seated and a word of instruction as we continue. We will commune the assistants and uh, up here first, and then we'll have a time for those who like to commune in your pews as well as you at home. And then we will invite those who would like to come up to the altar to receive communion at that time. Come to this table, which now extends into our homes. You who have faith and you who would like to have faith. You who have been here often and you who have not been here for a long time. You who have tried to follow Jesus and you who have failed, come. It is Christ who invites us to meet him here. This is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the body of Christ broken for you. And now those of you at home or those of you who wish to commune in the pews, will you please prepare the bread? This is the body of Christ, broken for you. And now prepare the wine or the juice. This is the blood of Christ, shed for you.
please stand as you are able. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the gift of his body and blood strengthen, keep, and unite us now and forever. Amen. Amen. We give you thanks, gracious God, for we have feasted on the abundance of your house. Send us to bring good news and to proclaim your favor to all, strengthened with the richness of your grace in your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Will you please join us in singing our sending hymn, Thy Holy Wings. the blessing of God. Remember that this blessing follows you no matter the places to which you are called. Remember that this blessing awaits for you even where you least expect to find it. Be blessed in the name of God who inspires, inhabits us, and ignites us today and every day. Amen. Go in peace. Jesus meets you on the way. Thanks be to God. You may be seated for a few announcements.